Geopolitics and Empire is joined by Paul of the Serious Report, which is an independent website with the aim of providing analysis and an alternative perspective on current affairs and global events that they believe are shaping a new political, economic, and social paradigm. They're fully self-funded, not backed by or affiliated with any private or state entities. The website is theseriousreport.com, as in S-I-R-I-U-S. Welcome to Geopolitics and Empire, Paul. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's much appreciated. Yeah, I've been following your stuff for a while, and I really love uh, what you do. And and maybe for people who haven't heard of Serious uh, Report, if you want to just tell us a bit about it, and as well as you know what is offered there for people who might be interested. Yeah, I mean, effectively, it kind of we. St- well, I won't bore people with the the reason we started. There was a whole bunch of reasons, and um, it was in 2016 and really it was to highlight what we understood at the time and even quite a few years before that that there was going to be this ongoing rise of multipolarity at that point it didn't seem very obvious to many people and also correspondingly what i referred to as the demise of unipolarity and we've just tracked obviously the progress of the rise of multipolarity and we made statements back in 2016 and said, look, you're going to see all these developments. I mean, one example we said was you'll see Saudi Arabia move out of the world of unipolarity and it will start to more and more embrace Russia and China. Here we are in 2022, and I think everyone would agree that's most certainly happening. So what we do on a sort of weekly basis is podcast it's subscription based and the reason it was subscription based is we originally thought well we could monetize the content and we tried and we were demonetized in mm. half an hour so we <laughs> multiple times we just gave up and went okay this is not going to work this way so we charge four dollars 75 a month or you can have a year's subscription for the cost of 11 months and that's where we detail all the major developments and ongoing developments and we've made a lot of predictions in the past that have come true with regards to the demise of unipolarity and the rise of multipolarity so this encompasses obviously geopolitics we look at the economics uh, and finance and uh, and just try to illustrate why for me uh, there is two worlds coexisting, and sometimes they operate very independently of each other. And sometimes, of course, those two worlds collide, and sometimes that can be a very spectacular fashion. And sadly, the Ukraine war is one of those examples where these two worlds have collided. And that might not make sense. But we can maybe discuss some of that shortly. But that's in a broad sense what we do and have been doing for the last six years. Yeah, I hear you on a monetization front, uh, Geopolitics and Empire podcast. Uh, we also, you know, people can support uh, me for, you know, five bucks a month or 50 bucks a, uh, a year. And I try to go that route uh, as well. You know, I opened a Patreon. It was growing. I get uh, it, it gets terminated. I think it was by NATO, though, because it was the same week I was mentioned in the Associated Press because of my interview with Francis Boyle. And, then we, and it was an article written by Atlantic Council, NATO's think tank, and then uh, and then you know PayPal, I get banned by the DHS uh, back in April from uh, PayPal, and so yeah, it's 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 not easy doing <laughs> what we do, and um, yeah, let's start with multipolarity again. Uh, I was going to say that's your big picture focus, and it's something I've been talking about for years as well with everyone from Paul, Dr. Paul Craig Roberts, uh, William Engdahl on the rise of Russia, de-dollarization, BRICS, the decline of the West. That's been the point I've been looking at for 20 years. I, I left, uh, you know, the U.S. in the 2000s, and I've talked to cultural historian Morris Berman, who's written a trilogy on the collapse of the um, U.S. empire. Johan Galtung has been on a couple times uh, as well. And so you make it a point on your website to include the definition of multipolarity, where, which is, uh, quote, an international system characterized by four or more major centers of power and influence. The system is characteristically different from unipolarity, bipolarity, and tripolarity because power is distributed across a greater number of states, thus creating a unique system of constraints and incentives." End quote. So if you want to tell us um, more of your of your big picture view of this, you know, the decline of the West, unipolarity, the rise of the East, the world island, however you want to call it. We have people like Graham Allison talking about the Thucydides trap, 
between US, NATO and Moscow, Beijing, um, you know, the BRICS plus rising uh, economically and, and with infrastructure uh, and so on and, and, and so forth. So what, what's uh, what's going on? A message from our sponsors. Our friends at Above Phone are on a mission to help people break free of the algorithm ghetto. They're starting with our phones because 99% of people today are addicted to the big tech ecosystem. We have alternative technologies available that Ramiro and his team at Above Phone have been evaluating. These tools are superior, not just alternatives. Are you ready to play above the rules of the surveillance capitalists? Let's remove our reliance on them for information, apps, and communications and break free of their tracking. If we don't contribute to alternative software with our participation, we may lose the few choices we have. When you get a degoogled above phone, everything is made simple out of the box. Just plug your cell service in and go, or use Wi-Fi only. The above privacy suite provides important services using open source software that is run reliably and privately. It gives you a VPN, private email, search engine, encrypted chat, voice and video calls, a calendar service, and an anonymous internet phone number. Because getting people on better systems is so important, they've upped their dedication to support. With each phone, you get a 30-minute support call, 24-7 email, chat support, and a knowledge base. Just like with our food, water, healthcare, schooling, and security, our tech needs to be sovereign. Browse available phones now and subscribe to the privacy suite at abovephone.com. Also, if you need health insurance that covers you wherever you may roam, check out my friend James Guzman's Borderless Health Insurance. One of the great things about living internationally is saving money on health care, but private care overseas can be expensive. Go to borderlesshealthinsurance.com to watch a short presentation on expat and digital nomad health care and sign up for a free consultation to review your options. Right. Well, let's start, obviously, with unipolarity. Everyone knows what that means. Effectively, it's U.S. hegemony, it's the U.S. dollar as the world reserve currency, and a whole bunch of satellite countries, obviously, including principally NATO, who sadly are not the allies. They've been vassal states, and in some cases, vassal states for many decades, Germany being the classic example of that. Now, obviously, we can pick moments in history where we see a decline in unipolarity, ironically, and I've said this before, which may surprise people, but for me, the United States was actually in decline from the Great Depression, so nearly 100 years, which sounds a little bit strange because of, obviously we talk about Bretton Woods and, and, and the birth of kind of the dollar as the world reserve currency and the construction of NATO and the IMF and the World Bank, etc. But for me, that was the writing was already on the wall for the U.S. at that point. But empires take a very long time to decline. A hundred years is not unreasonable to see an empire decline. And obviously, I think we can pick moments uh, in history. I think the Vietnam War was a moment of of decline for the United States. But financially, and I've made this point before, the big mistake. The UK and the US made in terms of the sort of Reagan Thatcher era was the financialization of economies. It was a complete disaster. They should never have done it. And, you know, we only have to look. And we had uh, in 2000 with the failed dot com era where trillion dollars was just white, ca massive capital destruction. That was a very clear indication that uh, financialization was not working. 2008 is a very obvious case in point, and they made serious errors of judgment. And I, in 2006, was screaming rather loudly that we were going to have a global financial crisis and, and explain why. And it turned out to be precisely why it was going to happen, and nobody listened. I worked in the financial sector at the time, the same during 2007. And of course, lo and behold, it happened in 2008, as everybody knows. And I got rather fed up of working in the banking sector and just went, I've had enough of this, and left at the end of 2008. But I wrote to Western governments, including the United States, the UK, and Germany, and said, whatever you do, do not do QE zero interest rate policy for any length of time. You can do it very short term for a few months. If you do it any longer, you'll wreck 
everything. You'll destroy economies. You'll destroy the financial system. And probably no one took any notice or even read what I said. But for me, once they'd entered into QE, zero interest rate policy for more than a few months, it was just a matter of time. The West fell into a very false sense of security in the, in the sense that they thought that, uh, that creating these asset bubbles wouldn't be a problem. But of course, at some point, those asset bubbles were going to burst. It also, they didn't think they created inflation, but of course they did because the inflation was in all the asset bubbles, whether it's equities, whether it's bonds, etc. And of course, we then had the pandemic in 2020, and that was another very serious error of judgment. Some people will argue they have no choice, but this time, rather than containing the inflation in, in these bubbles in the financial system. They printed trillions of dollars and it entered Main Street. That was the final nail for me in, in, the, in the coffin lid because that was going to cause huge inflation. And because it's for me, it was a statement to the obvious. And here we are, obviously, in 2022 and with, with serious inflationary problems. And of course, what they've done over the decades, they've gutted Western economies. We don't produce goods like we should do. We don't take a dollar or a euro or a pound, and make it into, you know, one dollar twenty or whatever. Uh, we just have a lot of debt recycling in, in our economies. We have a service based sector that doesn't produce any well. I'm not saying we don't have any industrial output, but it's very little relative terms. And and we've kind of, in the United States, they've lived way beyond their means for way too long. And eventually the writing was going to be on the wall because you cannot continue to sustain your economy, your financial system doing this. There was, there was always going to come a point with the U.S. where it overstepped the mark. And there's an irony that one of the biggest mistakes that the U.S. made was, in fact, obviously, and this is a statement of fact, the U.S. was behind overthrowing Yanukovych in 2014 in Ukraine. I mean, this is, people can disagree, but it's, it's a statement of fact. Now, that was a very, very bad decision to make because what do we see hot on the heels, even though multipolarity was beginning to gather a little bit of momentum with the BRICS in 2009, etc. But what do we see within a matter of months was the first kind of signing between China and Russia of uh, the power of Siberia, a gas pipeline, $400 billion equivalent, because very quietly it was all going to be done in North dollar terms. This was the beginning of the move away in a, in a significant way in terms of de-dollarization. And, of course, what's happened in the intervening years, and we had, of course, Russia invading Ukraine, and I, I've always referred to it as a war. Call it a special military operation. It's, it's still a war. Now, again, the big mistake the West made was deciding not just sanctioning Russia's banks, but doing it to their central bank. And also, of course, in the process of doing that, do it, you know, they signaled to the world, hang on, not only are you sanctioning a central bank, but you're also effectively stealing, we don't know, it might, it probably is a $300 billion equivalent, for stealing their assets. And the Global South has been warned about the risks of, of being part of SWIFT and uh, holding dollars, suddenly had a huge wake up call, went, hang on, we could be next. And this is why we've seen particularly this year, a, a significant acceleration away from using the dollar, not just, of course, Russia, who had no choice. But we've seen with India, for example, uh, trading with Russia in non-dollar terms, seeking to do it with other nations in the process. And, uh, and we've seen this acceleration now of Saudi Arabia moving out of not quite the petrodollar sphere, but in some sense they are, but into the multipolar camp, which they had been, with quite a few developments in the last few years, uh, which were a big signal this was going to happen. So in essence, what we're seeing now is this gradual decline of unipolarity, and that's becoming more and more 
uh, obvious and the ongoing rise of multipolarity. So we've kind of charted in some detail now the, the, the demise of unipolarity. Now, in terms of multipolarity, what if, I can if, say, and I'm, if sorry, we could just, on. just uh, on that thought before we leave, Unipolarity. Sure. Uh, you tweeted, "History is litter littered with ideologues who believed they were are doing the right thing, only to destroy everything in their wake." That is precisely what is now happening in the West as the empire continues to its collapse. Uh, and co. And uh, you know, in the early two thousands, I studied history. I taught history, and I kind of take a big picture view. You know, you take uh, inputs. You know, you, you read all these books about cycles, right? Fourth Turning, Peter Turchin, uh, many others, and. Just your further thought, I, I saw 20 years ago in the West, you know, the, the empire declining, uh, which would mean economic decline, as you, you've been mentioning, culturally, you know, more degeneration, and politically becoming more uh, authoritarian. So I feel like these are being borne out, all of these trends. I mean, that, that's part of that historical cycle. And as I mentioned before, you know, many of us Americans were, were, were having... Uh, accounts turned off there are people being put on no fly lists um you know all these sorts of things would you uh agree and, and any further thoughts on you know what that uh decline might look like in, in western europe or the united states yeah for sure it's it's very typical of empires as they decline they, they in their desperation to survive they start to do things that you would ordinarily regard to be more extreme. Now, we have to be careful what we mean by that, but but for sure you've highlighted some very clear examples of that where most certainly the West is. Um, and the Ukraine war is a great example of this, these ideologues, because fundamentally, and we're not here to, to discuss the war per se, but from the West perspective, perspective there's a lot of ideologues who just absolutely hate russia for the sake of hating russia and that is driven western policy with regards to the war and i've said this elsewhere it's, this is no surprise but they didn't at any point think okay if we're going to sanction russia what are the implications if these sanctions don't work on russia and what is the, the sort of blowback or boomerang effect they never gave it any consideration because ideologically they were so driven to think we can crush Russia in, in a matter of weeks, we'll crush its economy, its financial system, the ruble, and we'll get rid of Putin in the process, which of course was nonsensical because Russia had made huge strides forward since 2014 in terms of trying to insulate itself from the risk of being cut off from SWIFT because there was rumors back around 2014-15 that the US might have done it. And I said at the time, if they do this, it will be an absolute disaster. It will blow up in their face spectacularly badly, not least because of the trust and reputational damage in doing so. But it, it's the age old problem. If they thought this through, they, they wouldn't have just jumped headfirst in going, I know, let's cut uh, uh, our supply of cheap energy. And this is particularly Europe. Germany is dependent on cheap Russian energy for years. If you suddenly say we're going to we're going to uh, cut ourselves off from that cheap energy supply, and now you're going to buy energy three, four, five times more expensive, when you've already got inflationary problems, you've already got problems in your energy sector because you've been deciding to 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 live the the green revolution nightmare, as I call it, then you're asking for serious trouble, and they totally underestimated. Uh, the resilience of Russia to withstand the sanctions. They hadn't sort of ever learned any lessons from 2014 that Russia had withstood sanctions at that point. Okay, it wasn't as extreme in some sense, but it was a very clear indication that they had the capability to do this. And they also thought we can isolate Russia and didn't realize the global south is very much supportive of Russia. It's not necessarily in an overt way, but they they are in a sort of more, not covert, but less obvious way. And they totally underestimated all these uh, these permutations and, and possibilities, just thinking, we'll destroy them. And of course, now it's it's seriously backfired on them, and, and Europe is having serious problems. And now we've got to the point that there's elements in Europe questioning 
the United States and how they're profiting from the war and how they're charging Europe extortionate rates for energy. What a surprise. And, and therefore, you know, the whole process of going into this war and not seeing the bigger picture and thinking what the consequences will be it is spectacularly myopic, frankly, beyond foolish. And also it's given a lot of impetus to multipolarity, to the global south. He was saying, well, yeah, now's the time we have to grab the initiative. We, you know, we, we had reservations about the U.S. We felt threatened by the U.S. in terms of dollar hegemony and SWIFT, etc. Well, they're becoming more emboldened now and going, well, actually, we can go it alone because collectively we're getting strong. And, and they feel that they've got the Chinese and, and the Russians who are, I'm not saying they're overtly supporting, but they, they feel there's some backing to this. And they, they actually sort of grow more of a backbone to stand up to the threat of sanctions. And also, of course, saying, well, how do we get round sanctions? Well, we de-dollarize. And, of course, we've seen the rise of the dollar against just about every currency nearly. And they're all going, well, this, this deflationary, uh, well, sorry, not deflationary. The fact our currencies are devaluing against the dollar and we're having to buy and sell goods in the dollar, it's killing us. We, we, we're, we're having huge inflation problems. And then they went, well, when we can trade with each other in our dollar terms, we, we remove that problem. And India is a great example of this. I mean, the, the rupee was, was, uh, devalue quite significantly against the dollar and they went but we can trade with russia in rubles or rupees and it's fine we don't have a problem so it's that acceleration process that ironically the ukraine wars provided and again it's one of those situations where the west should have looked at this and gone okay we may have confidence in the outcome but what happens if that doesn't happen what happens if the exact opposite happens what's it going to do for us and uh, and they never thought about this so there's a kind of irony that the Ukraine war in 2022 is damaging unipolarity even more and actually giving some momentum to uh, multipolarity in the process. Yeah, and, and before we just move on to the multipolar aspect to get your thoughts on, as you, as you mentioned, we don't have to go into detail. I mean, it's clear that, you know, from Napoleon's time to Hitler, that for centuries the West has hated uh, Russia. I had on... Um, a while back, Swiss journalist, intellectual guy, Matan, uh, he wrote a book about this. Actually, his thesis is that for a thousand years, the West has hated Russia. We've got the RAND documents, you know, how they want to dismember, decol decolonize, or as Putin has said, defang the Russian bear. And you, you wrote, quote, U.S. is in a proxy war with Russia and sought to destroy it, isolate it on the world stage and have Putin removed. And uh, you also mentioned people still believe Putin is part of some one world governance plan. It's so ridiculous. A 10 year old could see this was not reality. So just, uh, you know, before moving to multipolarity, um, your thoughts on the prospects of, uh, you know, what happens in Ukraine, whether, whether uh, there's the real prospect of wider wars breaking out on the European continent, uh, you know, with Ukraine expanding to, I don't know, Poland and, and, and other parts of Europe, and then we're in the World War III scenario or in the Indo-Pacific, uh, as well as how, you know, your, your comment on the whole, uh, you know, Putin World Economic Forum Great Reset thing. Right. With regard to the Ukraine war, no, I, it won't, I don't, it won't expand because if Russia goes to war with Poland, it's World War Three, and neither the United States nor Russia wants World War Three, and particularly the U.S. doesn't want World War Three, which is why it keeps constantly saying to the, to the Russians, look, we're not crossing red lines, we're not giving Ukraine these weapons. Because this is not a popular thing to say in the West, but it's, uh, it's a statement of fact. Russia militarily is like years ahead of the United States and NATO allies in terms of hypersonics and uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles that now got the SARMAC. SARMAC can destroy an area the size of Texas or France. The West is in no position to go to to uh, to the status of World War Three and mutually assured destruction was always this, like, well, no one's going to go to war on that basis. Well, yes, absolutely. But even more so, the United States, for me, its missile defense systems are worse than useless. It would never be able to defend itself against 
the hypersonics and SARMAT. So, and what the United States has seen increasingly, and uh, some of this technology they saw in Syria, because the Russians allowed them to see it. They also gave the Americans some demonstration of hypersonics in 2019, and the, the U.S. military nearly had an aneurysm because they realized how deficient the U.S. was in comparison. So, no, the cooler heads inside the U.S. military, which is why recently they're going, we need negotiations. This war has to end because they understand they that they don't want any escalation because if it escalates and we did go to, to World War Three, then... The risk is the, the United States could suffer enormous damage and Russia potentially might not do. And this also ties in with the fact Russia has S-600s and S-700s. It just doesn't. I mean, it's someone not accidentally let slip, deliberately let slip. They have S-700s. And the story goes they can shoot any missile out in, on the edge of the Earth's atmosphere and anywhere in between. So... These are the kind of things that factor into the U.S.'s thought process with regards to the Ukraine war. For sure, they want Russia to lose the Ukraine war. No, no one's disputing that. But there's a world of difference between wanting them to lose the war and ending up going, to, ending up in a world war because of of your support as a proxy for Ukraine. The U.S. isn't going to have World War Three because of Ukraine. If Russia started launching missiles at Poland, yes which they're not going to do if, if for some unbelievable reason Russia was to start launching missiles at the United States. Yeah, it's World War III. I mean, or any other NATO country. So, no, I don't see it spreading. I, in any way, shape, or form, I'm probably one of the few people who's always said that World War Three won't happen. And, and I'm absolutely 100% confident about that because the – the the imbalance between NATO and, and Russia is so huge they would not take that risk, and and at the end of the day you always get hot heads in politics, in, in, in the neocons or in the Beltway etc. But the cooler heads know we're not we don't want World War Three we're not going to have World War Three, so no I'm not concerned about World War Three or or it escalating because the plain simple fact is what I mean. Let's take Poland. What's Poland going to do? Launch missiles at Russia? No, of course it's not. Uh, what, uh, so what happens if Pol people think, oh, the Poles might try and get involved in Ukraine? Doing what exactly? This is all very sensationalistic headlines. It's like when the U.S. Airborne Division was in Romania. Oh, they, they, there's going to be an imminent invasion of Western forces. They're going to join the war in Ukraine. No, they're not. This is just Again, blown out of proportion from, from my perspective. So, no, I don't see that to be a problem. Now, the issue of Putin and one world governance and the world economic forums is embarrassing because we're supposed to believe that Putin's part of some one world governance structure while the West is trying to, to remove him from office, destroy the nation state of Russia economically, financially, via this war. I mean, there's, the things just don't stack up. And and there, you only have to listen to the Russian. They made it very clear what they're in opposition. And this isn't whether you agree or disagree. Just listen to what they're saying, because that's the thing the West keeps mis misunderstanding. Russia's very clear. It tells everyone what it's going to do, and everyone goes, no, it's not going to do it. And then it happens. And then they ignore it. And then Russia says something else. No, that's not what they're going to do. And they've made it very clear all the way along. Now, in terms of the World Economic Forum, I've made this point very, very clear. The World Economic Forum has existed for decades, for over 50 years. And then suddenly, two years ago, we were supposed to believe that, that Schwab and the World Economic Forum was, were controlling the world and we were going to roll out one world government again. Well, what do you think they were doing for the previous 50 years? I mean, it just, it doesn't stack up. The World Economic Forum story came out because it's been sold as this is because this is fear. That China's going to take the world over. China's going to be a global hegemony, which is, of course, is nonsense. That's never going to happen. Oh, oh, look at China. China's got the central bank digital currency. 
And that got twisted into this story about, oh, China's China, look what they did. They did it. They did this test and they forced people to spend all the money in a very short period of time. That's what they're going to do in the West. It's part of this communist takeover. Well, China didn't do that. China put a time limit because they were trying to stress test the platform. So they wanted everyone to spend it in a short period of time for stress testing. That was all, but it got twisted into, we're going to have central bank digital currencies and it'll be exactly like China. And we're going to have a social credit score system like China because it's communism. Nobody in the West has a clue that the social credit score system in China has got largely nothing to do with people. It's to do with businesses. So this whole thing got morphed. Now people have, in huge numbers have grab this idea that the world economic form is trying to take over the world and there's one world governance coming in. Well, just ask the global south if they're going to be part of this supposed one world governance. The Chinese, the Russians, the Iranians, the list goes on. Absolutely not. And again, this is one of these situations where something gets said, it then, the reality gets twisted into this narrative and now everything's trying to support a narrative. So, Absolutely not. The, the, and people go, well, Putin went to the World Economic Forum. So what? And did people listen to what Putin said? He basically said, and I'm not, I'm not paraphrasing it, the, uni, the world, there was a time when people thought unipolar, you know, unipolarity would be the future. It was never going to happen, and now it's in terminal decline. Unipolarity was the attempt. To form one, a one world government. That's why it's called unipolarity. That came in Bret Woods effectively in 1944. And at the time, the Americans said to, to the British and the Russians, we should have one world governance. The British and the Russians said to the, to the Americans, it's never happening. And it was dead on arrival 78 years ago. And these stories keep, I mean, I've known this for. 30 years these stories keep getting recycled resurrected that there's an idea for one world governance and therefore as the west declines people going oh yes but china and the, is rising so that's going to be the powerhouse and the center of one world governance the west's moving east they're gonna they're gonna operate it from china no they're not china's made it very clear as as has russia but the nation that they're absolutely opposed to all and here's the thing they, that's why we have the Ukraine war because the dying embers of unipolarity is trying to destroy Russia because they see Russia and China as the backbone and they think if you take out Russia, China will capitulate there's other elements on the flip side in the United States politically you go we don't really have a problem with Russia, China's our problem, we want to see China destroyed so Let's try and get them into a war with Taiwan and let's sanction them and see if we can destroy them instead. It's all around the fact that these two nations are seen as the backbone or the fulcrum of multipolarity and that can't be allowed to happen because when multipolarity succeeds, unipolarity is dead, it's over. And hence why the idea of the West deliberately destroying itself is just absurd because once the West is gone, and its empire is dead, it's over. Never in history has an empire ever gone out of its way to deliberately destroy itself so it can come back five minutes later and go, we've got a new improved empire. Yeah, terribly sorry we destroyed everything in the past, but we're, we're going to get it right now. Once the Western empire is gone, it's gone. It won't exist again because multipolarity is moving in and filling that void, and hence... You're going to have one world governance when 88% of the population believes in the global south, which is the antidote to unipolarity. So what's this one world governance structure going to do? Is it just going to be in Europe and the United States? No. And that's the other thing. No one's deliberately trying to wreck Western economies because look at what they did in 2008. Everything's trying to preserve that. And in foolish ways that have resulted in the fact that they keep making spectacularly bad decisions and people go, they can't be that stupid. It must be deliberate. Well, no, it's, it's, they are that stupid. They, they are incapable of making the right decisions. And now we've kind of got to the point where the West 
just won't accept unipolarity is dying very rapidly. And it's going to have to embrace the multipolar world and find a way to fit into that. And really, at the end of the day, it's got no choice because if we look at uh, the, the status of the West economically and financially, we've reached the end of the line. We've reached saturation. We've saturated in debt. We've, we've consumed to the point we can't consume anymore. We've abused our financial system to the point we can't really abuse them. We we are in we can't compete with the global south because if we want to compete with China, we have to pay Chinese wages. Well, how can people in the United States or Europe live on Chinese wages? They can't. It's absolutely impossible because of how we've geared our economies, our financial system, and and how our how our societies operate. So we have to, dare I use the word reset. I kind of spoke about the, this reset, now I call it multipolarity more and more because people think I'm talking about this supposed great reset from the World Economic Forum, which, of course, again, is just words. I mean, Schwab came out with this statement in 2014 and no one took any notice of it. The reason he tried to resurrect it again was because we had the pandemic and he thought, oh, I've got this vision of how I, I see the future of the world, but most of the world's not interested. And now, I've I've known people who indirectly who know people who've been to Davos, and their exact words of people who go there is, it's just a gigantic talking shop. People throw all these ideas around. Does it have any substance or reality? No. And look over the last five decades, how many of these discussions that have happened at Davos have ever seen the light of day? When did anything out of Davos ever realize itself in in, in the world? Never. So, but we're suddenly supposed to believe that that now now somehow Davos is controlling the world and it's going to usher in this technocracy and all these things. I mean, no, this is not how it's going to be because multipolarity proves this, proves it categorically that the world is not embracing unipolarity, meaning one world governance. And that was the point of the World Bank, the IMF, the dollar. By having the dollar as the world's reserve currency, trying to force nations to use it in international trade, that's a form of one world government. Mm -hmm. It's been staring people in the face for decades, but no, apparently it, it doesn't. And now they think because people are in the alt media, particularly, are pumping a narrative. And there are also people in the right, in politically, who are pumping this narrative about because it's all. You know, they're very anti-China because it's China's trying to take the world over, and we said this earlier on, and it's all about communism. If you mention the word communism to people in, in the West, it's a trigger. They get triggered and they get angry or because it provoke, provokes emotion in them, fear. And that's the whole point of this. It's just trying to push a narrative and because the right sees this as, as an opportunity to try and demonize China, make people in the West perceive China to be this threat to their very existence, which China was never going to be. We can criticize China for whatever you like, but they're never going to be a global hegemon. They're never going to have try and control the world. They have absolutely no interest in doing that. Mm -hmm. J I, again, just before going to multi the rise of multipolarity, you, you bring up so many good points, but j just one thing that does bother me, and I, I don't look at it from a china focused perspective as you say the chinese social credit system i view it as something that the corporations or, or interests are trying to roll out uh, across the board and, and in some cases it's worse in the in the west uh, you know this cashless society idea i've had people on in the past like a jewish historian edwin black he calls it the algorithm ghetto like uh you know uh, comparing it to the jewish ghettos and he's saying uh you know if we go to a cashless system basically it's like an electronic concentration camp and you know if you don't behave your accounts will be shut off your digital passport for work and travel will be shut off you know i i've lived in kazakhstan i've met people i met a guy in the train an older man um who was banned from flying because of his activist activities and he's had to resort to literally taking 50 plus hour train rides to get uh anywhere and then you know i've had my patreon turned off paypal people are having bank accounts shut off during the pandemic you could not 
Uh, I still cannot go back home to America. I mean, I'm a Mexican national. I'm a U.S. national. I'm a Croatian, European <laughs> national. But my wife is an unvaccinated foreigner. So she's not allowed to go to the U.S. And, uh, you know, we saw at the height of the pandemic, people were here. There was a state here in uh, Mexico uh, that said, you know, you cannot go to buy food in a supermarket. You can't even go to a public park if you, if you don't have a vaccine certificate. So, um, you know, my kind of point is th this uh, technocracy. Uh, and I, in that sense, I don't care about China. I just see countries all across the planet were attempting to to, to try this. And I, I'm I feel there's a great danger there. I mean, just any other thought? Um, uh, on that uh, aspect. Okay, you make two points. Let's deal with the cashless society and why that will never happen. And this is why it won't happen. Because in the world, all organized crime works on cash. The entire drugs cartel works on cash. Now, if you were to say we're eliminating cash, the big drug cartels would start taking very serious action against governments imposing. You have, obviously, horrendous human trafficking, child trafficking, all those disgusting things that happen in the world. It's all based on cash. So if you have a cashless society, what we're saying is that'll all stop. No, it won't all stop. I mean, so therefore, cash will always have to be here. The cashless society thing is, is, is a story that I know has been doing the rounds for 20 years, and it keeps being resurrected. And the question is, most of us use, uh, oh, I, I've, I've got a digital bank account, like everyone else. How often do I use cash? Very, hardly at all. Now, okay, there's an argument, yes, I can use cash if I want to. Most of the time, I don't bother using it anyway. And yes, in principle, they could cut me off from my bank account, but they can cut me off from my existing bank account. If they want to, they can do anything. How often does that, does that ever happen in the West? Hardly ever. Maybe it happens occasionally to people because they end up sanctioning what happens. But again, this is one of these stories that, yes, in principle, anything can happen. But we had the same thing with the pandemic. Remember when the pandemic started and they locked everyone down and, and we had the stories, well, now we're locked down. We're going to be locked down forever. We're never going to get out of this. And at the time I went, this is nonsense. Of course, this isn't reality. And then they remove the lockdowns. And then people are going, oh, next winter, they'll lock us all down. They're just letting us have a little bit of time off. Well, why they would let us have a bit of time off makes no sense. But again, this didn't materialize. And here we are today with most countries. Yeah, you're right. I can't travel to the United States because I'm not vaccinated. Absolutely. But broadly, you can you there was no restrictions in the united kingdom they removed them all on the 19th of july 2021 and that was the end of it we don't have there was no restrictions and so all these fear stories were just fear stories and then what happened then it was oh hang on we've dug this huge hole for ourselves we told people all these things would happen oh i know we'll reinvent the story and tell them that was just a dress rehearsal so one minute we're screwed we're going to be locked down forever that's a dress rehearsal. Wait till they roll out the next pandemic, and then monkeypox happened. That's it. This is this is this is the big one. This is where they're going to lock us all down again. Oh, what a surprise! It never happened. So here we are today, and and this is why I say these. What happened is there are people out there who enjoy putting people in fear, and what they do is they look at a situation and go on the balance of probability. What's going to happen? And they try to look see, and, and make it look like they're very knowledgeable and they have some inside track on things and we can see the future and they're just working on the balance of probability that something's going to happen in the future. Oh, look, I see, I told you this would happen. But then things don't happen. And then they, they reinvent the story and they change it because they're constantly trying to validate what they're saying. And in the process, they drive people into fear. Now, for me, anyone who deliberately drives people into fear or the euphoria, we have that with the QAnon nonsense, is a huge problem. These people are not on the side of humanity by doing that because they drive people into extreme emotions because then they have them a captive audience. Hence why we've still got huge amounts of people who still believe QAnon's real and that 
someone's going to say the United States and the Republic, and they genuinely still believe it. That's what happens when you drive people in to polarized emotions. And for me, that's deplorable. I'm not disputing all the reality of the problems in the world. We know they exist. This is irrefutable. But these stories have been doing the rounds longer than I care to come in. Every so often, they get recycled. They, they, they get reinvented. It's like it always used to be about the Bilderberg Group. Now it's no one, no one talks really about Bilderberg. Now it's the World Economic Forum. And in two or three years, it'll be something else. And this is what keeps happening. And yes, for sure, I'm not disputing the things that happened during the pandemic to people. I, I'm not in any way, shape, or form denying. But here we are today. These things didn't pan out how these people said they do. But they're always then looking for another angle to convince people that we're all doomed, that, that, that we're going to be in a technocracy. But here's the point. We're supposed to be in a technocracy where we have nothing. So if we have nothing, which means we don't own anything, we and, and we and, and we're living in a feudalistic system, in a, a feudalistic technocracy doesn't really work because we won't have access to technology because we can't afford to have access to technology because we have nothing. But again, that's not reality. And how did all these? And if we talk about corporations, corporations only exist because. They make huge profits at our expense because we consume everything. If we have nothing, we're not going to consume anything. So these corporations will go bust. They will have nothing either because if people can't afford a mobile phone, well, who's going to buy mobile phones? No one, so they go bust. Mobile phone operators go bust, and the list goes on and on. And that's the reality. We, the work, the world only functions, and we have paper rich billionaires and, and more because we consume what they produce. The other thing is if you have this technocracy and that you have no financial system. So all these financial speculators won't won't they're they're gone. They're dead and buried. So we're supposed to believe that all these bankers control the world and they make huge amounts of profit. But we're saying in the next breath well that will cease to exist. And do we really think the financial system is just going to and are people who who function in that system are going to go, yeah, we're happy with this. We're just going to lose everything. No. Again, now I've talked about this in many times. This is the reality mm -hmm. of how these things people think they're going to pan out. The right. system works very well currently because we all complain about things. We don't like the political system. We don't like government governments. We don't we moan about things in our everyday life, but fundamentally, not everybody, of course. But most people go, oh, yeah, but it's okay. You know, I'm doing all right. That's how they control people. They don't control people by screwing them into the ground and making sure they have nothing. They give us enough to make us think we're doing okay, even though we are being screwed by the system to some degree or to a, a larger extent than perhaps many people realize. That's how you control people. If you take everything off them, how is that going to work in the United States? 300 million people with 600 million guns controlled by who exactly? That's not going to work out very well. Never in history have we ever seen an empire survive that, that turned on, it, on the people. Look at the Tsars in Russia. That was the biggest empire, the richest empire in the world at the time. Look what happened. They didn't survive for precisely the reason that in the end, people got fed up with it. Okay, the... The West was involved in it, and they were stoking the, the revolution. But that's not the point. The point is, if you push the masses of the Western world into that situation where they have nothing, they're not going to sit there and just take it because they take it now because they're not actually on an individual basis being destroyed. Not yet. And, and, but, and we always knew, if we go back to me, to uh, sort of 2006, and I went, it's over. The West is finished now. This is the end. They're going to have to accept reality. But the point is they don't want to accept that reality. They want to keep everything going. And that's why they tried to do everything since 2008 to stop everything collapsing. But now we're supposed to believe in 2022, oh, they've decided now they're going to collapse everything. 
It's completely illogical. You don't spend years trying to stop the very thing that you now go, well, well, actually, we've decided we're going to collapse it. So, no, I, I'm very, very adamant about this. I'm, I'm not some, I'm in a very small minority of people. I accept there are huge fundamental problems and all the disgusting things that go on in the world. That's irrefutable. But the idea that there's this big plan to, to wreck everything deliberately and, and turn us into some neo feudalistic states is just not reality. As I say, good luck trying that in the United States. It will mm. never work. The people would rise upon mass. And who are these people anyway? These small group of people. They're going to control 300 million very angry Americans. It's not, it's not going to work. It will end very badly for them. And for me, this is just a very logical thought process. It's, but again, it drives people into fear. It sounds terrifying. This technocracy, neo feudalism, and you know they they can put in a, you in a cashless society. And if they don't like what you say or do, they're going to cut you off and and you know starve you to death effectively. Well, this sound, it, this sounds very frightening to people. But then we have to go. Okay, think about the reality if they try to implement that. And yes, I don't doubt there are. We know in in the world that the things have happened. But the idea, after all this time in the West that we've lived in this world, in the way in, uh, as it is for all the flaws in the West, of which there are many, and we're going to have a wor- more extreme version of of, of neo feudalism and technocracy, and this is how they'll control us all, is is for me is just not going to happen because we've just highlighted why it will it will never succeed, mm-hmm. and this is why we now have. Governments in the West going, <clears throat> there's a huge cost of living crisis. I know they privately, they're all terrified that this winter, where people could end up, they can't pay their energy bills, there might be blackouts, all of it, energy cuts for long periods of time, all the problems we know. They're really frightened that the masses all rise up against them. So they're going, just give them loads of money, just get, bail out their energy bills, just. Just give them anything because we cannot afford to have the masses rising up against us because precisely for the reason they then can't feed themselves, they're freezing cold in the winter. That's not even a technocracy or neo-feudalism. That's just a reaction to what's developing in economies and financial systems. What we people are talking about is 20 times worse. So if they're fearful of this, what they're not fearful of that, of course, they're even more fearful of that. And that's why they did what they did in 2020. They went, we have to bail the world out, the Western world. If we don't bail the Western world out, the masses all, all the, 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 there'll be huge societal unrest, just throw money at everything. And people go, oh, only big corporations, et cetera, got stuff. Uh, and only big businesses. Yeah, they, people were getting their salaries paid, you know, who were working in business. So, so they wouldn't make lay them off and make them all redundant. So then, and then they couldn't live anymore because they can't pay their bills, because they can't pay their mortgage, their rent, etc. This is reality. We have to look at the fact they're very, very fearful of tipping the balance where the masses in the West get very upset, and the risk is that creates societal unrest on a huge scale because they can't control it. If you suddenly have millions of people. In a Western nation, protesting or or the risk of something even worse, they've lost control. It's over. They will. The, the control's gone. Be, before we run out of time, I, I do want to get to yeah. the the new new world order, as some people have called it. You know, multipolarity. This. Um, so we've talked about what's going on in the West and the unipolar system, and you know what what you think. Uh, the future will look like, you know, this new financial architecture that's being talked about. Uh, Russia's economy said, hey, Glazyev, uh, I've, I've read Putin call for a new international reserve. Uh, so I guess, you know, not the dollar, maybe a basket of the Eastern currencies. He's mentioned digital currencies. I've been reading about ASEAN, the Union of Southeast Asian States. Uh, apparently, they're working on pooling their currencies to create uh, one regional sort of digital basket of, of of currencies i guess akin to the euro and you just w- what are your thoughts on what this new system w- w- will look like you know we we see the russia activating the mirror cards as you know they're uh 
alternative to visa although i think there are bumps uh, along the road right i i, I read in kyrgyzstan that uh, a dozen Kyrgyz or more banks have stopped using the mir card because they're afraid still of u.s sanctions and so uh just uh, your thoughts on what this BRICS plus whatever you want to call it you know new new order will look like economically politically and and, and so forth well yeah i mean fundamentally they we've seen the rise of many of these big enormous economic political alliances you you mentioned asian uh, there's the rcp there's the eurasian economic union there's the shanghai cooperation organization it's BRICS morphing into BRICS plus there's the gcc which is evolved now in in the gulf and uh, uh, mercosur etc and there's all these entities sort of alliances, multilateral alliances that are all different poles within the multipolar world. So the clear idea is we divest ourselves out of dollars. We trade with each other for now in local currencies. That's the first step where it's where it's applicable and where it's possible. It's not always possible, of course. But the long term thing is, and BRICS is a good example of this, where there will be a currency and and this is where the <laughs> come back to digital currency it's been very clear from uh from the global south perspective i mean BRICS is one example they will want to have a basket of commodities with each of the currencies how it will be weighted we don't know there'll be probably a component of gold in this and what that will allow BRICS nations to do is they can trade it with each other using this BRICS plus currency why do they want to do that because it's far cheaper it's far more efficient it's far quicker it's outside the dollar system and they can trade with each other very happily using this currency now the exact weighting how this will work at this point is not clear it's it's morphed many times over the years and of course now with more nations wanting to join BRICS, the question is how does this work because, I mean, if you've got 30 nations in BRICS, it's going to be a bit tricky to try and absorb all the currencies. And you can't have some currencies that are part of it and then tell them, well, actually, because these are the nations, John, you know, you're not part of this uh, this um, commodity-backed currency with, you know, weighting of the existing BRICS nations, for argument's sake. So some degree of complexity is with, it revolves around how that will actually work. but. The argument could also be that BRICS nations can then trade with ASEAN nations. Okay, there's some, you know, there might be some overlap with because China's part is, is sort of part of ASEAN or trades with ASEAN. So there's certain countries in different uh, these alliances where they, there's an overlap, clearly. But the ASEAN, yeah, absolutely, they can form a digital currency and they can trade with each other. And it's, per, it's great for international trade or wholesale trade or wholesale transactions, which is 99% or 98% of global transactions anyway. And again, they can operate internally outside the, the purview of the dollar. And again, the question is, how, how will that work in the future? At this point, it's not absolutely clear. But the idea of having commodities, gold, etc., is so you're returning to sound money. So currencies are backed by something that of tangible value rather than fiat currencies because the fiat currency experiment's dead. You now the West thinks, well, it's impossible to work with with any currency backed by anything. Well, it's called living within your means. And the West is has abused that so badly. That's why the West's economies and financial systems collapsing because they've abused fiat. And you don't you can function and grow an economy sensibly and manage it on the basis that you use sound money back i mean currencies and china could have a gold backed uh, yuan small footnote to this is in 2016 they were intending to announce it early 2016 that they were going to do that and the americans told them it was a declaration of war and that was at that time the end of that but that can get resurrected because we're back to this thing of where the world of of, of has changed dramatically because of huge advances in Russian military technology and the Chinese uh, are also developing things rather quickly, which 
lends itself to to the notion that China and Russia do have a military alliance. They just don't admit it. I mean, it's one thing having it, another thing publicly saying it. So that's a possibility. Russia itself, yes, it could have a the ruble backed by commodities. It may end up being backed by gold because both China and Russia have massive gold reserves themselves. The Iranians do as well. So in essence, what the whole multipolar world is to say, we don't want to be part of the Western financial system anymore. We know the Western financial system is doomed anyway, but we don't want to be part of it because why should we permanently feel threatened and coerced to 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 tread the, you know, the, the path of what the United States wants us to do rather than what's in our best interest? Well, if we trade outside the dollar, there's nothing they can do. And the global south is big enough. It has enough resources where it doesn't really need to interact with the Western world. Okay, that in the short term isn't practical, but we're talking a long term in 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years. And this is a, a gradual process that's accelerating where there can be less and less of the world trading in dollar terms, which is hugely advantage for the global South nations. And this is hence digital currencies again. <laughs> The digital currency story is being twisted into, well, in the end, we'll all be using central bank digital currencies. And notice the United States is testing the so-called digital dollar with a whole bunch of financial institutions in terms of banks for the intention of international trade. They've looked at the Chinese, the digital yuan, and gone, we have to, we have to be as competitive as them. We need a digital dollar for international trade. Otherwise, the risk is everyone will want to use the digital yuan or, or the BRICS currency, digital currency in the future for international trade. So this is what's focusing the minds of people increasingly in the US. But no point anyone sat there going, we're going to make this retail and everyone's going to have a central bank digital currency. So then they, if we say something they don't like, they can switch it off again. This is just alt media entertainment. It's very... I'm not going to go into that detail again, but that's another example of this. So, in essence, multipolarity is a long-term project. This, for the next century, will probably belong to Asia, but not entirely, because Africa will begin to develop as a whole, and at some point that will be have enormous uh, potential and will realize that potential. So you've got South America, Africa, the Middle East, which is increasingly rotating away from unipolarity and the petrodollar and embracing alternatives. I mean, we've even got some degree of rapprochement between the Saudis and the Iranians. Now, that's another example of some of these huge changes that are happening. And you've also, of course, got Asia. And, and therefore, the premise is we can all work together. We don't need a world reserve currency, which, of course, we don't. I mean, there's this myth in the West that, well, we have to have a world reserve currency. So nothing can replace the dollar at this time. So the dollar's fine for the next 20, 30, 40 years at least. So what's the problem? They're not actually realizing you don't need a world reserve currency. And therefore, the dollar can become irrelevant just simply because it's utilized less and less in international trade to the point in relatively short order, the global south could be going, well, we're trading amongst ourselves. We're 88% of the world's population with a growing vertical economic mo growth models in the world. And and we, therefore, would render effectively the dollar irrelevant. Well, who's, who's the United States going to trade with if they, don't, if they just stop trading with the U.S. for argument? So can people go, that will never happen. But that's like in history, there's lots of occasions where people have said things will never happen, but they will happen. I mean, so what? The U.S. is going to trade in dollars with with the eurozone. The eurozone is doomed anyway. So it becomes a situation where the dollar doesn't entirely disappear, but it becomes irrelevant in international trade, and then the U.S. can't sanction people anymore. I mean, what are they going to do? Threaten to sanction the Asian nations? We're all trading with each other. They'll just say, "Well, what are you going to sanction us with? We don't trade with you. We don't have anything to do with you anymore." So. It, who cares? It's, it becomes irrelevant. And that's another problem with the Ukraine war is 
by sanctioning Russia and trying to cut them off from the West in totality, okay, very selectively with regards to energy and fertilizers, etc. But in essence, the principle was to try and do that, and they failed because Russia's <laughs> said, if you don't want us to be part of, of the SWIFT and dollar world, fine, we don't care, we don't want to be anyway. And they've shown other nations who've gone, actually, there is an alternative, and it can work. Okay, Russia's an exception because there's massive resources, but it's hardly really ex exploited maybe 25% of it in its entire landmass. So it is an exception, but the principle applies. That's why multipolarity is gathering momentum, because not only is it is it a way of, of getting out the dollar system in US hegemony, but also because the global south knows the West doomed. It knows the problems that have happened in 2008. It's seen the problems that have happened since then, and it understands that the West economically, financially, is, is a spent force. And there's a point worth making with regards to the real reset or multipolarity is there was people who went to the Chinese and the Russians in the late 90s and said to them, the West is doomed. At some point, we're not, we, at that point, we said it could be decades away. The dollar will cease to be a world reserve currency. The, the Western financial system will blow up. The economies will blow up, and it's your turn, effectively. So hence why China joined the World Trade Organization, why, why China resurrected the old Silk Road, the Belt Road, one Belt, one Road, as it was originally called. This is why all these developments are happening, because these people from the West went to them and laid out very clearly, you're going to have to grasp the mantle because the West is in terminal decline. Now, at that point, very few people believe this. Now, why am I telling you this? Because I met these people in 2010 who told me everything about what their, their vision, what they saw, not just because it was a post-2008 global financial crisis world. And they, they, they laid out a whole bunch of very high-level ideas and what you would see. And everything they told me has panned out. And when I mean everything, I mean absolutely everything. And that, they were the architects of resurrecting or invoking multipolarity, the, the reset out of unipolarity. The old world order of unipolarity dying, and you have to be careful saying, I don't want to use the word new world order because people panic, but there's a there is this there's a world order which is about everyone working together in mutual cooperation. So there's win win possibilities and understanding you're never going to agree on everything. And why do you need to agree on everything? You you but you you realize it's far more beneficial to work together and cooperate uh, rather than being having adversaries and this zero sum game mentality that the United States operates currently. And that's why, in a very broad sense, and we haven't discussed any of the specific details in terms of multipolarity and all the things that have happened, particularly in the last decade or so, but more so really, probably since 2016, 17, and then obviously during the pandemic and, and obviously during the Ukraine war and how it's accelerated those processes, but that's that's in essence what this reset is in, and and it's a reset of and recalibrating the world to think very different about how we work with each other. So adversaries learn to get along with each other and realize, in fact, you know what, we don't actually have as many fundamental disagreements as we thought we did. A lot of it was fueled by by the Western Empire, by the United States, and not exclusively, in terms of convincing us all that, you know, that we that that they we had to support the empire and, and at all costs. And if we don't, and then we're doomed and and we'll have regime change which we've had and we'll, and we'll have wars and uh, and leaders being assassinated, et cetera, et cetera. And they've kind of realized we, we've just had enough of that. And anyway, the West is totally unsustainable. And of course, the United States in its infinite stupidity has spent the, the, the whole duration of, of the Ukraine war 
just shooting yourself in the head to put the torso, as has uh, Europe and, and the United Kingdom. And, uh, and now it's uh, interesting, of course, that even so-called allies, they're all now arguing amongst themselves the disagreements inside the European Union, where the, the, the bureaucrats exist. They're all in disagreement. There's nations disagreeing with each other. There's people inside political systems disagreeing with how the war's been prosecuted. There is European nations very angry with the United States. And this is what's happening as, as the reality of this war unfolds and how it's boomeranged on us in the West. Nations are now starting with back to the fear thing. They start to go, well, we invested all this political capital. We told our people the war would be over quickly. Well, we'll crush Russia and, and the war will be over. That's not happened. You'll suffer a little bit of economic hardship. Now we're suffering huge economic hardship. They're sat there going, we can't justify this anymore to the people. And they're very, very fearful. And we're starting to see this. The people in the West will no longer support it. In, even if it's supporting it by not protesting, they're very, very fearful that protests will grow. And, and of course, if, if it comes to the point where Ukraine loses the war, and it's irrefutable in the context of what might happen if they have, that will be the end of the Western Empire. It will be the end of NATO. Europe will fall apart. Europe and the United States' relationship will fall apart because it will be dog-eat-dog. Everyone will want to blame everyone else because they're sat there going, well, we don't want to, we don't want to be held uh, responsible for what's happened because I've got 60 million people or 68 million people in the United Kingdom or 300 million people in the United States or all of a sudden, huge amounts of them have got serious economic problems, financial problems, and all the things that have, that have been building up since 2008 that have been accelerated during the pandemic, during the Ukraine war. That's what they're fearful of. And, and that's why they're desperate in terms of convincing everyone in the West Ukraine's winning the war, because they're so frightened that people will just say enough's enough, we've had enough of this. But they know the consequences, and Stoltenberg admitted it by saying, if Russia wins the war, NATO's lost the war. Well, if NATO loses a war, it's over. Because... In, in that situation, European nations are going to look at this and go, hang on, how, how, if NATO and we, we can't even protect Ukraine, how is it going to protect us? And there's people in Europe already start to go, we need our own European security architecture, and we need to consider Russia in that context, whatever that might be. In reality, that's what they're really fearful of, because they're seeing the writing on the wall. And this is why I come back to the point. There isn't people in the West trying to turn us into this feudalistic state because that's exactly what they're desperate to avoid. Because how are they going to control hundreds of millions of people in Europe all over the United States? It's impossible. You cannot do that. You can only do it when people don't think there's a problem, even though there is a problem. But as soon as it is a problem, it's over. And that's why they're very, very fearful. And we've heard leaders coming out talking about concerns about uh, the, 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 how this will impact society. That's a very gentle way of saying we're extremely nervous, and privately they are very nervous because they know the, the risk is the writing is on the wall. But, of course, the problem is the more they try to push the war, and, and from a Western perspective, the worse they're making Western economies, the Western financial system, societies, they're risking causing way more problems. But that's political capital. They've invested so much. If they walked away from the war tomorrow and said, that's it, you know, it's over, we, we, the political fallout in Western countries would be enormous. Because people would sit there and go, well, why did you fight this war in the first place? You gave us all these assurances. None of them have happened. I've suffered the consequences. You can, you know, I, I'm paying like, 10 times what I was for my energy. My food bills have gone up 30%. I've got a cost of living crisis. I might risk losing my job. And increasingly, people are. You're putting me and my family in a precarious state. You're responsible 
and now you're walking away from the very thing that you told us wouldn't be a problem. The optics are so horrendous, and that's what they're extremely fearful of. You, you've given us a lot to chew on, and for some of the folks listening, uh, generally optimistic, I take. So there's, you know, not going to be World War Three. <laughs> there's no global technocracy, so people can chill out uh, um, a bit. And again, I'll include all of the links in the description. You're on the big tech platforms uh, and uh you know the the website is the serious report.com uh, again where are the best places for, for people to find you uh uh online yeah i mean obviously thank you you mentioned the website we're obviously on twitter we, we're pretty active that's at the serious report <laughs> talking about the, the fallout of the ukraine war that caused our following to explode from about 8,000 followers in February to nearly 120,000 now. It's just the bizarrest reasons why people show an interest. But just a small point, yeah, look, I'm not disputing the West faced enormous challenges. We know this. We're, we're going to have to go through this huge evolutionary cycle of accepting that the empire as it exists is over. And that creates huge challenges directly and indirectly for all of us. But for me, yeah, I'm very, very certain of the fact that we're not going to have these doomsday scenarios. I mean, yeah, I've talked about the collapse of the West, and uh, the Soviet Union collapsed, Russia collapsed. I mean, Russia was in a far worse position than we're going to be. But Russia's come out the other side and look where it is today. So throughout history, things collapse, but it's not the end. It's not like we're all doomed and then it's over and and who knows you know we're all we're all going to face uh living the rest of our lives in abject poverty and all this no that at some point someone's going to go enough's enough and we have to do something about this but no i don't share these these uh doomsday prophecies that are because they're just recycled stories i've heard them so many times in so many different contexts but as i come back to the point and there isn't a group of people in the world controlling anything. There are all these different interests who have different reasons to do the things they do. So the military industrial complex wants to sell arms, of course. So it wants wars. It wants conflict. It wants to convince the Asian nations that China's a threat so they can sell a load of arms to them, even if they never fire a single bullet. Yes, of course. I mean, and they're all, you know, the financial system. Is one of those competing elements. There are people politically with different viewpoints. But here's something to, to think about, and it and it, it highlights very eloquently how complex and convoluted the world is. Yeah, the United States is in a proxy war with Russia. We all know this. But they also have back channels. They also very clearly understand red lines. And we go to bed at night and wake up in the morning with the world pretty much the same way it is because of these back channels because the United States will phone Russia up and go, you know, we are aware of this terrorist threat. Here's some intelligence because it's in both our interests that you resolve this, even though they're at war with Russia and vice versa. There's that level of cooperation. That's how ridiculous and, and frankly, at times insane and complex and confusing the world is. That's the reality. There aren't these people sat in some ivory tower somewhere or some castle or plotting the end of, of, of civilization. I mean, this is, you know, they're all competing with each other. They're, they're, they want to, to, to make sure their little part of the empire survives. So hence why. You know, we know a big financial system is in the West. They're not going to give everything up because why, why would they want to do that? Why would they destroy their own empire? Okay, they're destroying it through stupidity. But they don't want to have it destroyed by someone else because they're one of the competing influences. They're not. So that's what I said. That everyone at times will cooperate with each other because it's in their interest. But if one of these competing elements feels that one of the others is trying to, is going to try and put their nose out of joint or destroy them, they're going to react to that. They're not going to tolerate that. And we've seen throughout in, in, in recent time that. You know, if if someone quite legitimately tried to take a, a wrecking ball to the Western financial system, 
in a very overt way as a political leader. How long do we think that political leader is going to survive? They're not. But we're supposed to believe there's these people trying to do that. No, and I'm trying to highlight the point is, yes, we're in very challenging times. No one's disputing that. There are enormous problems we're facing. And all of Western society, to varying degrees, is going to have to deal with this. But but the idea, and I'm more worried about the fact we don't have anybody who's competent enough to, to make the right decision, to know what we need to do, rather than worrying about some some group of people that no one really knows or people have speculated who these people are and, and they're trying to, to roll out some sort of uh, uh, feudalistic system whilst the global south's going, well, we're not doing it. So hang on, it's only 12% of the world's population at the most. And, and here's the thing, the West is dependent on the global, will be dependent on the global south for critical resources. Look at the United States. It's, it needs heavy oil because it's light oil is useless for diesel. So what we're supposed to believe is that the, that the United States is going to destroy all that, destroy all these relationships, and then the whole country grinds to a halt and nobody's able to, you know how important diesel is in the United States because the main diesel providers, they're all in the, the, the Russia-China camp. It's Russia, Venezuela, and Iran. And again, this, again, this is the complexity of how the world operates. The US is fully aware of this, which is why behind the scenes going around, just give us some of the oil. No, we're not giving you the oil. Uh, Venezuela, come on. You know, I know we've tried to remove Maduro for years, but we'll, you know, we'll remove some sanctions. Come on, get on side. Uh, Russia, just keep giving us some heavy oil. We just would do, we'll ship it via, I don't know, Sicily or something. No one will know it's happening. <laughs> this is how the world works. And there is a, there is a payback. But Russia is saying to the United States, okay, we'll support you. We'll stop your entire society collapsing if you don't have any diesel. But there is a price to pay for that in the process. I mean, <laughs> you know, this is the complexity whilst they're both at war with each other. I mean, and, and people go, this is impossible. But this is the absurdity of how the world works. And, and we need to just get away from this very black and white Old media driven idea that there's this group of people, these transnational people, and they're all out to destroy us all. Well, just, just ask uh, the Chinese, the Russians, and the Iranians if that's a reality. And, and if the big corporations in the world want to be destroyed, well, fine. They just won't exist. But the rest of the world will carry on doing what it's doing. And, and, uh, and at some point, there's going to, if that was ever to happen and the West completely collapsed, to that extent, in the end, there'll be people in the West going to the Chinese and the Russians. You know, you're going to have to come and help us because we've got complete societal meltdown. We've lost total control. And that's the other thing. If you lose complete control as of, in term, then what governance structure is going to be put in place? So these people who saw the people believe or how the governance system works in the West, which manages okay as things stand, is prepared to risk having. 300 million Americans or whatever, totally in a complete societal meltdown, who then may try and have their own governance structure, who then might form some government that the country votes for, who then has control of a nuclear arsenal. And someone's going to allow that to happen or take the risk of that could happen. Absolutely not. <laughs> That's why the existing structure has to survive to some extent. Whether the political system exists as it does now in the United States in the future is not the point, but there has to be this, this structure in place that means things like that don't, don't end up in whoever's hands because of an entire societal meltdown. And if you, if anyone really thinks that big corporations and banks are going to play Russian roulette with their existing empire on some hope that they can subjugate the entire American population without there being a backlash, Sorry, that's that's living in a fantasy world. That's kind of like Hollywood. That you, you can make a film about that and say that this happened because that's where it belongs. It's entertaining. It's enthralling. It's frightening. It's it's the but is that practical reality? And and I've just highlighted why the the military is never going to allow itself to be put in a position that that could happen because then we could have 
a uh, World War Three because 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 we have a complete meltdown and and some political entity takes over and decides we're going to wage war with with Russia on the basis of that. I mean, it sounds extreme, but I'm trying to highlight a point that you don't play Russian roulette with an entire Western world on the basis that you think you're going to be able to roll something else out which benefits no one except who doesn't benefit corporations, doesn't benefit the financial system, doesn't benefit the military-industrial complex, doesn't benefit anybody who currently makes a huge amount of profit out of the system as it exists, and that's why it cannot be sustainable. And I'm making, really emphasizing this point. So, yes, we have problems, but our problem isn't because these people are going to try to, to roll out something that if people think about it, it's just not, it's just not a reality. It, it will never happen because there are so many risks in trying to do that. No one's going to, no one's going to play. It's like, in fact, it's not even Russian roulette. It's, it's like Russian roulette on steroids. No one's going to take those kind of risks because the, the risk is you, you could cause a problem that spirals so badly out of control. And then we're back into the red lines and why there's, we go to bed at night and wake up in the morning with the world the same. That would all go out the window. Because you imagine if, if the United States turned into that. And Russia's looking at this, and China's going, how the hell do we deal with this nation anymore? We don't even have back channels anymore because they've been switched off because they've, you know, there's this new political system. Some of the, the Republicans and the Democrats have gone, and there's this governance structure, and, and which is completely incapable of understanding how important those back channels are to prevent miscalculations. And everything the United States is doing with the Ukraine war is to prevent that, to say we absolutely can't have World War Three. we don't want nuclear confrontation, we have to do everything to ensure we don't step over each other's red lines. And there's many red lines, they're not all about World War Three. Like when the Crimean Bridge was blown up, that was a red line. Look at the Russian response. They just started uh, having massive missile strikes on all Ukrainian infrastructure. That was because a red line was crossed. And the statement was, if you cross that red line, that's what we're going to do. And they did it. Again, that's so if all that goes out the window, then the entire world turns into the Wild West. Yeah, and we're back to that point. You know, no one wants World War Three. I just saw a clip uh, today of Putin himself driving across the Kerch uh, Bridge. So that was um, interesting. It's very sunny, especially sunny here in Mexico. So uh, it was great to start the week out. On a positive note, getting a reality check from the serious uh, report.com. Uh, no doomsday here. And uh, well, thank you for being on Geopolitics and Empire, Paul. Well, thank you very much. And, you know, I, it's, we're doing very high level stuff, but I think it's important. And I, and I hope why what I've said is important. I mean, there's a lot of detail, but there's no point diving into the detail initially. But just don't get driven into fear or euphoria, or as I always say on tweets, don't be entertained, be informed. It's extremely important. I hope you enjoyed this Geopolitics and Empire podcast. The website is geopoliticsandempire.com, and I encourage you to sign up to the free email list that notifies you of every new podcast and other important updates. The email list and website are our last lines of defense. We're being censored and deplatformed. It's almost impossible to find Geopolitics and Empire on the Google search engine. We've been blacklisted. YouTube frequently strikes videos. Facebook restricts our page. Reddit, Twitter, and LinkedIn take down posts. After the Associated Press mentioned Geopolitics and Empire in a 2021 article co-written with NATO, or the Atlantic Council, our Patreon account was terminated. Vimeo also terminated our pro account at one point. In April of 2022, the Department of Homeland Security had PayPal ban us for life. The best free way to help geopolitics and empire is to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or elsewhere and subscribe to all of our media channels. You can find the video broadcast now on five platforms, Odyssey, Rockfin, Rumble, BitChute, and Brighteon. You can find the audio broadcast on the entire podcast ecosystem, SoundCloud, Apple, Spotify, and so on. My current favorite social media channels are Twitter and Telegram, 
But you can also find us on Gab, MeWe, Minds, Float, VK, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. You can support this guerrilla signal by donating via DonorBox, Buy Me a Coffee, Subscribe Star, or Crypto. You can purchase a consultation with the host to talk about expatriation, geopolitics, or podcasting. You can also become a monthly or annual member via Stripe and receive benefits such as partaking in a monthly member Zoom call, get access to a weekly recording of my random thoughts, and a private Telegram channel. Thank you for listening.